Welcome to Crime, Corruption, and Cocktails, the true crime podcast where we look at cases of corruption and negligence and examine their historical and cultural implications. Today, I'm drinking a glass of Chardonnay. What do you have? I am drinking a hard apple cider, and on this week's episode, we will be discussing the Station Nightclub fire. This disaster took the lives of 100 concert goers and injured another 230 who were all attending a show headlined by Great White. This incident caused massive changes in how venues handle pyrotechnics and other safety measures, especially for smaller venues. On February 20th, 2003, the band Great White started their set at around 11.07 p.m. A total of 462 people were in attendance, even though the club's official license capacity was 404. The beginning of the song Desert Moon was accompanied by pyrotechnic set off by their tour manager, Daniel Beakley. He ignited flammable acoustic flame on both sides of the drummer's setup. The pyrotechnics were gerbs, cylindrical devices that produce a controlled spray of spark. The flacking gerbs were the primary cause of the fire. The flames were initially thought to be a part of the act. The music video accompanying the band's song showed flames around the musician. As the fire reached the ceiling and smoke began to come down, only then did people realize that it was uncontrolled. 20 seconds after the pyrotechnics ended, the band stopped playing and lead guitarist Jack Russell calmly said into the microphone, quote, wow, that's not good. End quote. In less than a minute, the entire stage was engulfed in flames. Most of the band's members and entourage fled for the west exit by the stage. The club's fire alarm system had just started to sound and people rushed to the front door, which is where they entered. This was despite the fact that there were four possible exits. The ensuing crowd crushed into the narrow hallway leading to that exit, which was quickly blocked completely and resulted in numerous deaths and injuries among the patrons and staff. Again, 100 died and about half of the survivors were injured, either from burns, smoke inhalation, thermal trauma, or crushing. Among those who died in the fire were Great White's lead guitarist Ty Longley and the show's MC WHJY DJ Mike the Doctor Gasalves. There is reason to believe that Longley and Gasalves tried to salvage equipment during the early stages of the fire and lost valuable time to escape before dense, toxic smoke made breathing near impossible at zero visibility. Longley is believed to have initially made it out of the building but then re-entered in an attempt to rescue his guitar. A number of survivors later stated that a bouncer stopped people trying to escape via the stage exit saying that the door was quote for the band only end quote. Following the fire an investigation was launched to determine who was at fault. The band, nightclub owners, the manufacturer of the pyrotechnics and foam, and the concert promoters all tried assigning blame to the other parties. The club owner said they did not give permission to the band to use pyrotechnics, while band members claimed they did have permission. A National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST, investigation on the fire under the authority of the National Construction Safety Team Act, using computer simulations with FDS and a mock-up of the stage area and dance floor, concluded that a fire sprinkler system would have contained the fire long enough to give everyone time to exit safely. However, because of the building's age and size, it was believed the station to be exempt from sprinkler system requirements. In fact, the building had undergone an occupancy change when it was converted from a restaurant to a nightclub. This change dissolved its exemption from the law, a fact that West Warwick fire inspectors never enforced. On the night of the fire, the station was legally required to have a sprinkler system, but did not. On December 9, 2003, brothers Jeffrey A. and Michael A. Dedarian, the two owners of the station nightclub, and Daniel M. Beakley, Great White's road manager at the time of the fire, were each charged with 200 counts of involuntary manslaughter. That was two charges per death because they were indicted under two separate theories of the crime. The first was criminal negligence manslaughter, which means a death resulted from a legal act in which the accused ignores the risk to others. The other was misdemeanor manslaughter, which is when a petty crime results in a death. The brothers pleaded not guilty to the charges, while Beakley pleaded guilty. On May 10, 2006, state prosecutor Randall White asked that Beakley be sentenced to 10 years in prison, the maximum allowed under the plea bargain. 
citing the massive loss of life in the fire and the need to send a message. Superior Court Judge Francis J. Darrigan Jr. sentenced Beakley to 15 years in prison with four to serve and 11 years suspended, plus three years probation for his role in the fire. Following Beakley's trial, the station owners Michael and Jeffrey Darrigan were scheduled to receive separate trials. However, on September 21st, 2006, Judge Jarrigan announced that the brothers had changed their pleas from not guilty to no contest, thereby avoiding a trial. Michael Dedarian received 15 years in prison with four to serve and 11 years suspended, plus three years probation, the same sentence as Beakley. Jeffrey Dardarian received 500 hours of community service. Judge Darrigan said the difference in their brothers' sentences reflected their respective involvement with the purchase and installation of the flammable foam. On September 1, 2007, some families of the fire's victim expressed their support for Beakley's parole. The State Parole Board received approximately 20 letters, the majority of which expressed their sympathy and support for Beakley, some going as far as to describe him as a quote-unquote scapegoat with limited responsibility. Dave Kane and Joanne O'Neill parents of the youngest victim, Nicholas O'Neill, released the letters to the board to reporters. It stated, quote, in the period following this tragedy, it was Mr. Beakley alone who stood up and admitted responsibility for his part in this horrible event. He apologized to the families of the victims and made no attempt to mitigate his guilt, end quote. Beakley has sent handwritten letters to the families of each of the 100 victims and had a work release position in a local charity. Parole Board Chairwoman Lisa Holly told journalists of her surprise at the forgiving attitudes of the family, saying, quote, I think the most overwhelming part of this for me was the depth of forgiveness of many of these families that have sustained such a great loss, end quote. On September 19, 2007, the Rhode Island Parole Board announced that Beakley would be released in March 2008. Beakley was released from prison on March 19, 2008. In January 2008, the parole board decided to grant Michael Dedarian an early release. He was scheduled to be released from prison in September of 2009, but was granted his release in June of 2009 for good behavior. In addition to the criminal case, the Dedarians were also fined $1.07 million for failing to carry workers' compensation insurance for their employees, four of whom died in the blaze. As of September 2008, over $115 million has been paid out or offered to the families of victims by various parties. The state of Rhode Island and the town of West Warwick agreed to pay $10 million as settlement for their failure to ensure that the station was following the fire code. American Foam Corporation, who sold the installation to the station nightclub, agreed in 2008 to pay $6.3 million to settle lawsuits related to the fire. In March of 2008, JBL speaker settled out of court for $815,000. JBL was accused of using flammable foam inside their speakers. The company denied any wrongdoing. Still Air Corporation agreed to pay $25 million as a settlement. Sealed Air made flammable packaging foam, which was improperly installed in the club, which required acoustic foam designed for that purpose. Providence radio station WHJY-FM, who promoted the show, which was MC by its DJ Mike the Doctor Gasalves, one of the casualties that night, Clear Channel Broadcasting, which is WHJ's parent company, paid a settlement of $22 million in February of 2008. In February of 2008, Providence Television Station, WPRI-TV, and their then-owners, Lynn TV, made an out-of-court settlement of $30 million as a result of the claim that their video journalists were said to be obstructing escape and not sufficiently helping people escape. In September 2008, the Jack Russell Tour Group Inc. offered $1 million in a settlement to survivors and victims' relatives. This was the maximum allowed under the band's insurance policy. The club owners have offered to pay just $813,000, which is to be covered by their insurance plan due to the pair having bankruptcy protection from lawsuits. There was also governmental changes as a result of this tragedy. Governor Donald Carcieri declared a moratorium on pyrotechnic displays at venues that hold fewer than 300 people. 
Within weeks of the disaster, an emergency meeting was called for the National Fire Protection Association Committee handling code for quote-unquote assembly occupancies. Based upon its work, tentative interim amendments were issued for the National Standard Life Safety Code in July 2003. The tentative interim amendments, or TIAs, required automatic fire sprinklers in all existing nightclubs and similar locations that accommodate more than 100 occupants in all new locations in the same categories. The TIAs also required additional crowd manager personnel. These TIAs were subsequently incorporated into the 2006 edition of the NFPA 101, along with additional exit requirements for new nightclub occupancies. It is left to each state or local jurisdiction to legally enact and enforce the current code changes. As a result of this and other similar incidents, fire chiefs, fire marshals, and inspectors required trained crowd managers to comply with the International Fire Code and many local ordinances that address safety and public assembly occupancies. The site of the fire was cleared and a multitude of crosses were placed as memorials left by loved ones of the deceased. On May 20, 2003, non-denominational services began to be held at the site of the fire for a number of months. Access remains open to the public and memorial services are held each February 20th. A permanent memorial at the site of the fire has been erected and named the Station Fire Memorial Park. In June 2003, the Station Fire Memorial Foundation, the, the SFMF, was formed with the purpose of purchasing the property to build and maintain a memorial. In September 2012, the owner of the land, Ray Villanova, donated the site to the SFMF. By April 2016, $1.65 million of the $2 million fundraising goal had been achieved and construction of the Station Fire Memorial Park had commenced. The memorial dedication ceremony took place on May 21, 2017. Jenny, what do you think of the Station Nightclub fire and do you think justice was served for the lives that were lost? I think this is probably one of the most tragic cases that we've covered and it really shows what a fire and I guess like natural forces can do, the damage that they can do. A hundred people died in this little club. I do think that justice was served. People did go to jail for a certain amount of time and there were a lot of settlements, which I found kind of surprising. But I hope that all of those settlements had been paid out. I also thought it was interesting that there were two charges per death. I've never heard of anything like that before. I think this is a case that was really like a perfect storm of just everything that could have gone wrong that went wrong. Regardless of the sprinkler system, they probably should not have had pyrotechnics in a small space like that. I don't know if you saw any pictures or videos from the club, and that's also another thing. There is so much footage of this fire and what happened on that night. It looked too small and way too tight, in my opinion, for pyrotechnics to be used. And I think if those security guards' alleged comments were true, that's awful and why stuff like this does continue to happen. And we'll talk about other situations, but this is something that you do regularly hear about still, like a nightclub, restaurant, theater on fire. I have a lot of respect for Beakley, and I think a lot of the victims' families and the victims themselves do as well. You don't often see people take accountability for their actions like that, their actions that inadvertently killed so many people. But I can't imagine, you know, the guilt that he must still face. Yeah, I definitely second that. I think Beakley is one of those rare individuals that knew as soon as it happened that he had a level of culpability. I think that the nightclub owners are a real contrast to Beakley. You know, from them not even having workers' compensation for the people that worked there, them immediately trying to make sure that people didn't find them responsible, which definitely seems to be connected to the financial pitfalls of the lawsuits, and then just tied into the fact that they filed for bankruptcy. Beakley and a whole host of other people are actually paying for their part in this. I think that the brothers really got off lightly, especially Jeffrey. Irregardless of the fact that Michael may have had more to do with the installation and some of the failures, Jeffrey was right there along with them. He was a co-owner. He could have easily stepped in at any point 
to make sure that things were done right. So the fact that he only got 500 hours of community service and didn't have to pay any real financial compensation, I think it's a weird thing. And I think it's the really one of the only places where justice wasn't served in this case. Now we're going to look at the primary causes for the station nightclub fire and others like it. So the most common reason is that the venue is over its capacity limit. Many localities have regulations in place to ensure only a certain amount of people are allowed in a particular place at one time. These limits are connected to the amount of people that can be in a building and safely leave in the case of an emergency. When venues are over capacity, it severely limits the usage of exits and other means of escape. Another issue is inadequate safety protocols. According to Firehouse, quote, the lack or inconsistency of plans can create disastrous results if in the event of a fire, natural disaster, structural collapse, or terrorist attacks, end quote. They continue stating, quote, fire and emergency personnel must be involved in pre-planning for events and training of venue staff and security personnel of their roles in the event of an incident. Emergency planning should be conducted well in advance of the event and must be thorough to address any type of incident that could occur. As a matter of training, venue staff and security personnel should also receive National Incident Management System, or NIMS, training and be a part of the venue's incident command staff, end quote. Connected to this is crowd control. When there is an uncertain or dangerous situation, people have the natural instinct to find safety. This reaction causes a major ripple effect and makes evacuations very difficult and causes additional conditions that increase the chances of injury. Many injuries are caused by crushing and trampling when exits are jammed and can't accommodate the amount of people that are trying to use them. Jenny, what do you think can be done to ensure that venues are protecting attendees? I think part of it is regular inspections with trusted people that will take things seriously. So that would just mean like making th- making sure things are up to fire code, maybe providing some more funding for fire departments or whoever is in charge of that. So they are able to hire more bodies, do a more thorough job. I think that would be really helpful. And if things aren't met, There needs to be repercussions that make people, again, take this seriously. And I say that because I don't think people really do take these issues of safety seriously. Everyone thinks that it's not going to happen to them. It's not going to happen in their venue. But you never know that. Staff really need to be trained. That's nice to see that there is um, that NIMS training in place. I think making exits well known and like really visible. I know that exits usually do have like a lighted sign or some will have like an alarm will sound if the door opens. I think probably inspections though, like I said, are the biggest thing that I think could be helpful and just making sure things are up to code because like we said, if there were sprinklers in place, that could have really helped everybody there and a hundred lives might not have been lost that night. What about you? I definitely agree with you that inspections definitely seem to be at the top of the list because in this case, and this is why the state of Rhode Island and the city had to pay out, they knew of the regulations that were already in place, but didn't make sure that the nightclub was following them. And your whole job as a regulatory agency is to make sure that things are being followed. And so I definitely agree that they bear some real responsibility in this case. And I think another thing is as a venue, making sure people know of the alternative exits that are available to them. You see in this case and a lot of others where people's first instinct is to go where they came in even if there are other exits available, because most of the time they don't know about them. The exits could be through a kitchen that they wouldn't have normal access to or in another part of the building. I do think that training staff is very important, especially when it comes to crowd control and when it comes to making sure that exits are not being jammed. And I think in addition to just not having pyrotechnics there, I think you should also always be checking your equipment to make sure that it doesn't pose a hazard to people as well. The station nightclub fire is unfortunately not the only fire disaster caused by venues ignoring public safety and creating a dangerous environment for attendees. We are going to take a look at two other examples of venue fires caused by gross negligence. The first is the Iroquois Theater fire. Located in Chicago, Illinois, the Iroquois had a capacity of 1,602 with three audience levels. The theater had only one entrance. 
A broad stairway which led from the foyer to the balcony level was also used to reach the stairs to the gallery level. Theater designers claimed this allowed patrons to quote-unquote seen and be seen regardless of the price of their seats. However, the common stairway ignored Chicago fire ordinances that required separate stairways and exits for each balcony. Despite being billed as quote-unquote absolutely fireproof in advertisements and playbills, numerous deficiencies in fire readiness were apparent in the theater building. On December 30, 1903, a Wednesday, the Iroquois presented a matinee performance of the popular Drury Lane musical Mr. Bluebeard. Tickets were sold for every seat in the house, plus hundreds more for the standing room areas at the back of the theater. There were an estimated 2,100 to 2,200 patrons attending the matinee, including children. The standing room areas were so crowded that some patrons sat in the aisles, blocking the exits. At about 3.15 p.m., shortly after the beginning of the second act, eight men and eight women were performing the double octet musical number in the pale moonlight, with the stage illuminated by blue-tinted spotlights to suggest a night scene. Sparks from an arc light ignited a muslin curtain, probably as a result of an electrical short circuit. A stagehand tried to douse the fire with the kill fire canisters provided, but it quickly spread to the fly gallery high above the stage. By this time, many of the patrons on all levels were attempting to flee the theater. Some had found the fire exits hidden behind the draperies on the north side of the building, but found that they could not open the unfamiliar bascule locks. The Iroquois had no fire alarm box or telephone. The CFD's Engine 13 was alerted to the fire by a stagehand who had been ordered to run from the burning theater to the nearest firehouse. On the way to the scene at approximately 3.33 p.m., a member of Engine 13 activated an alarm box to call additional units. Initial efforts focused on the people trapped on the fire escapes. The alley to the north of the theater, known as Couch Place, was icy, narrow, and full of smoke. Aerial ladders could not be used in the alley, and black nets, concealed by smoke, proved useless. It is estimated that 575 people were killed on the day of the fire. At least 30 more died of injuries over the following weeks. The other case is that of the Beverly Hills Supper Fire. The Beverly Hills was a major attraction in Southgate, Kentucky. The site had been a popular night spot and illegal gambling house as early as 1926, and actor Dean Martin had been a blackjack dealer there. Though the building's frame were classified as non-combustible, the Beverly Hills Supper Club made substantial use of wooden building materials, including floors for two-story portions of the complex and framing on interior halls. It was decorated throughout with highly flammable carpeting and wood wall paneling. Event rooms also used wooden tables and support, as well as tablecloths, curtains, and a variety of other small combustible materials. On Saturday, May 28, 1977, the Beverly Hills Supper Club was operating beyond capacity, largely due to the popularity of that evening's cabaret room show, featuring popular actor John Davison. Later estimates placed the total number of people in the Beverly Hills Supper Club on May 28 at approximately 3,000, substantially more than the 1,500 people that the fire coal allowed at that time for a building with the number of exits the club had. Around 9, 10 p.m., the power failed, panic ensued, and even those who had been calmly moving towards exits in the cabaret room began to push and shove each other. The situation was made even more desperate because of the three exits in the room. Two were soon blocked by the fire, leaving the crowd to funnel through a single exit. Employees outside the exits attempted to pull guests to safety, but the crush of bodies as those pushed upon those in the front became so silent that no amount of strength could free most of them. Many of those who escaped the crush blocking the northeast fire exit became lost trying to find other exits. The building's confusing design often led to a set of doors opening into a bar area that funneled frantic guests into a dead end. Firefighters alerted that the majority of the building's occupants were in the cabaret room, focused their efforts there, but even the combined efforts of every fire department in the country were simply too little too late. Temperatures in the cabaret room soared into the thousands of degrees, and even firefighters, weary and dehydrated, were soon unable to safely attempt any further rescue. 
At 11.30 p.m., fire command, suspecting that the building's roof would soon collapse, ordered all firefighters to evacuate the building. At approximately midnight, the roof did indeed implode into what remained of the building. The total death from the fire was eventually determined to be 165 people. That wraps up this week's case. Thank you for listening. Let us know in the comments what you think about the station nightclub fire. You can read more about this case and how to support us in the links below. We will be back next week with a brand new episode focused on the attack on Nancy Kerrigan and Tanya Harding's involvement. As always, stay safe.